Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, I'll be doing another product review for you guys. I'll be talking about some USB based digital microscopes, specifically from a company called DinoLite. I met these guys at the RFIC IMS trade show and I was immediately impressed by the variety and the quality of their products. They had some really neat demos set up at their booth. And I've been in the market for a USB digital microscope myself and they were kind enough to send me a whole bunch of different models so I can uh, demo them here for you guys so you guys can also see what these things can do. They also sent me uh, two different kind of stands which I've assembled behind me and I'll talk about those too. These digital microscopes have some unique features that makes them very useful for high magnification situations. It doesn't have to be electronic components but for us for electronic components and I'll show you what these unique features are they also have a really long working distance allowing the microscope to be quite far away from the subject that you're trying to look at which is all of course very handy when you're working under those situations so they don't the microscope is not too close to the subject you're looking at so I have a whole bunch of uh, electronic circuits and really interesting tiny tiny components that I want to look at under the microscope and in the process of that we will learn about the features of these and we will evaluate the quality as well as the software and the hardware to make sure everything is, is good and then you can decide whether this will suit your application or not. Well, I've been quite happy with them, so let me show you what's going on. So this is one of the two Microsoft stands. This is model MS36B, which you can find on their website. And uh, the first thing I noticed after opening the box uh, before assembling it was that every single aluminum piece that's in here is really well precision machined. And this is even more so for the other model and I'll show you. Which means that things don't wobble and things fit really, really snugly and well together. And there's no freedom when you move them around. They don't shake around, which is, can be very annoying uh, otherwise. So I'm impressed with the quality of these as well as the other stand. This thing has quite a few degrees of freedom that allows you to move the microscope and place it in a whole bunch of different positions. Of course, the front, which is uh, the unit, this, this, this unit is made of plastic. This is the part that holds the microscope itself. So it is nothing to it really. It's just a screw and then allows you to attach it to this uh, rod right here. So then this itself gives you uh, a whole bunch of degrees of freedom. And then there is this large screw here, which by turning you will loosen and free this rod from moving back and forth or rotating completely 360 degree. So you can imagine a scenario where you have something that's vertically this way and you want to look at it in this direction, you can easily get that uh, orientation of the microscope. And if you pull it long enough, then you can have a complete degree of freedom. And you can see a little tiny attention to detail, like there is a little aluminum piece that comes that gets screwed to the end of this rod, which prevents you from pulling it out accidentally. So there is quite a bit of uh, attention to detail, which I really like. And then whenever you tighten it, it will stand quite firmly uh, in place. And on this side, you have the, the main screw, which allows you to lower and raise the entire unit up and down. And once you're satisfied with some position that you want it to be in, then you have the focusing knob, which then, of course, raises and lowers the microscope by a little bit at a time. This has a nice firm feel to it. There is no give. It really stays where it's supposed to stay. And finally, at the bottom, there is a ring. And this ring allows you to set a minimum distance. This can be very useful. Usually microscopes have this. It's because when you're paying attention to the image, when you're not looking at the microscope, you can actually lower this too much, for example, and crash it into the subject you're looking at. So this, you can set as a safety mechanism. Let's say you set it over here, then you cannot accidentally lower this microscope uh, more than this distance to crash it into the subject you're looking at. So pretty nice unit, lots of degrees of freedom, and I, I will set them both side by side. So let's look at the other one. So this is the RK-10A stand model and uh, this is a, a higher class of course and uh, it's just as well made as the original one that I showed you and in fact it has some really nice features that I, that I like. First of all it came of course in multiple pieces which you assemble yourself with four allen keys at the bottom. It only takes a couple of minutes to put these things together and even the allen key of course is included so everything is there that you would need. And uh, it, it's a really solid unit. I mean, this piece is, is precision machined and attaches to the base quite well. It has the same working distance as the MS36B model that I just showed you. And then uh, it has a couple of pieces that separate. So in the front is the microscope holder, which is of a higher quality. Again, if you look, every little screw is, uh, has the metal threading uh, inserted in it, including even the one that is used to to tighten the microscope grip. So these things are going to last for a very long time. And it has two inserts here, so you can place a microscope at different distances in there. And then you're again, you're similar to the other model, once you place it in, uh, you can rotate it around. And even 
I don't know if you can tell on the camera, but let me remove this. Even the, the, the insert metal here is, is serrated so that the screw really catches it. So there is no, there's no way for this to slip over the surface. So there's a lot of attention to detail. You can see the precision machining that I was talking about. So even when you place this here, it, it is flush uh, with this piece completely, not on a curved angle. It also has this groove here, and this groove locks with the screw that is in this piece here, allowing it to be set to a vertical position very easily, but then if you don't want it in a vertical position, then you just loosen the screw a little bit more, and then it becomes free rotating. So it has, a, you know, again, a lot of the attention to detail, I like that. And it also comes with a, an extender arm as well, which you can use to further increase, for example, uh, let me see, get it in here to further increase the range of motion that you can have with this. So now you really, really have a whole bunch of different angles that this thing can take. I mean, you, you can, it can rotate in almost every direction. So usually for, the, for electronics work, this piece isn't entirely necessary because you'll be mostly looking vertically down. But if you have a vertical board again or some weird angle that you want to look at, then you can have this as an attachment. Uh, so this is a very useful extra piece that comes with this. And as far as going up and down, uh, by rotating this screw, you can raise and lower, like so. You can raise and lower the main microscope. And uh, let me put this back here so you can have an idea of what I'm talking about. And it has this other feature that I really like because most of the time you'll be changing magnification and you want to move up and down quite a long distance. This is usually intended for mainly getting the focus. So it has a little button here on the side. And by pressing this button, you can easily raise and lower this very quickly and then it locks in place. And I can tell you, this thing feels absolutely smooth. There is no give to it. Even, even when I press this button, it really is, I'm pressing quite hard and trying to rotate it and nothing. It really stands in place, very, very high quality. It also, of course, has the protection like the other one. Uh, you can raise and lower this as well, which would sit the lowest position the microscope can ever take. So it looks really, really nice. So I'm going to set both of these units next to each other and then I'm going to connect two different models microscopes and to the computer and we can take a look. But first, let me show you the microscopes close by in a close inspection so you can see what the actual uh, microscopes themselves look like. And there's also a bunch of other Velcro accessories that allow you to, you know, to tie the microscope cable to it and so on. So we'll get to see that. So let's look at the microscopes themselves. So here I have all three models lined up. We have the AM4113ZTL, the AM4515ZTL, and the AM4815ZTL. Yes, the model numbers are really long, but on the website you can uh, sort and, uh, and select by feature, so you don't have to remember the model numbers. But the difference be between these models are, are quite straightforward. Uh, this one, they're all part of the H-series, so they all have the enhanced um, uh, imaging sensor, of course, built into them. This one has a basic polarizer, so you can adjust the polarization of the light that comes from the microscope, which can reduce glare and reflections, and we'll see that. Moving up from that to the 4515, this one has the automatic magnification reading capability added to it as well, and it comes with more accessories. And then the 4815 ZTL has the extended depth of field as well as the extended dynamic range imaging capability also that the software can take advantage of. So it really, this is kind of the order of the models as they get more and more advanced. They all offer their long working distance, so they all have that extended working distance which is very useful. I'm not going to go through unboxing them or anything like that, but you know, just to take a quick look, let's look at a basic model here. Uh, the microscope is, of course, and um, we'll take a closer look at that separately. And it comes with a whole bunch of little accessories, you know, all, all nicely, neatly packaged in there. And it also comes with, for example, uh, the DinoLite calibration film, which allows you to calibrate the distances because the magnification is adjusted manually. You can use these uh, fine lines, it's essentially a ruler that allows you to calibrate your image so to know what your exact magnification is and therefore then you can use the software to do precise measurements of distances and radiuses and so on. So it's all nicely packed together. Uh, you can take a look at their website for the accessories. I don't think that's too interesting for me to show you uh, here uh, in detail, but we'll take a look at it. So this is the, uh, the basic model. You can see that the microscope body is made of plastic. They also have metal uh, body microscopes as well. You can take a look at that. And it has a couple of different neat features. So here's the polarizer. So by rotating this front cap here, you adjust the polarization. The magnification is adjusted by this 
uh, this uh, rotation here and you can see there's numbers written there right on the microscope itself so you know it starts from it maxes out here at about a hundred or so and then it has a minimum of you know it goes below 20 so it actually rotates almost completely to the other side which is essentially at the normal working distance so about 20 to about 95 or so is the magnification of this particular model it has a magnification lock button so you can lock it in place so that this will not turn anymore but I have to say this feels really really nice there is no give there's no a loose section there the dead zone in here is very very smooth you won't accidentally rotate it by touching it very nice really good feel to it also the same with this one as well so I'm really, I really like the quality of these things and uh, in a nice and compact size and you'll see there the lights when we turn it on you can see again. The, the thing that, you, that I want you to note is that the magnification is all optical. So there is no, uh, dig, the software supports digital zoom of course, but the, all the magnification is done optically so the image quality really remains quite well. You're not sacrificing resolution at higher magnification. So this would be the AM413 and then we can look at let's say uh, let's say the higher model. I think I have it open. Here you go. This is the uh, the the, high, the highest model that I have here with me. This is the AM uh, 4815ZTL. So this has all the bells and whistles. So you can see it looks slightly different. Very nice construction. <laughs> nice color too. But uh, the polarizer here, this one is actually marked by rotating this. You can adjust the polarization. You can see it rotating on the inside. Everything else feels the same. Nice, nice solid feel to it. The magnification also nice and solid again this one goes from about 10 all the way up to you can see just under 150 magnification which is fine for electronics work really at 150 uh, magnification you're looking at dies and you know wires and, and, and ASIC so you don't really need something that high for soldering for example but for lower magnification is perfect the same thing it has a lock button here and both of them have this uh, soft switch here is a capacitive touch and then by touching it you can tell the software to do different things you can tell it to take a picture you can tell it to turn the light on and off there are a couple of different functions and you can completely disable it so if it's standing somewhere and you want to take a quick picture you just tap this and it will take a picture and then you go somewhere else and you tap it you take another picture you don't need to go back and forth between the computer so all nice and everything again these are plastic they do also have metal canned bodies uh, versions of different uh, slightly different versions of these that have a, a metal body that's also nice if you need something that's a little bit more sturdy otherwise all nice and good again this one also optical uh, zoom of course built in so let's set two of these guys side by side and look at some interesting stuff under the microscope so here I have both of the microscopes set up this is the 4513 model the Dino uh, Light Premier and this is the 4815ZT the Dino Light Edge series both of them have long working distances I have set them to two different magnifications to look at two typical things that you might be interested in on the left I'm looking at an analog devices board with an ultra high speed 2.5 giga sample per second ADC on it. It has a lot of really small components, 0201 footprint surface mount components on it, which would be quite difficult to see with the naked eye. For example, the components in this region that I'm actually focusing on, I can't really see them. Well, let me zoom in here a little bit with the camera so you can appreciate uh, the board a little bit better. So we'll be looking at these really, really small components that you can see there. And on this side, I have uh, a PIC microcontroller, a UV, oh, let me see if I can get this to focus, a UV raisable microcontroller here uh, that I've put under the microscope as well. So it has an opening window for a UV raising, of course, which we can see the die. So we can look at it pretty close and see the die of the microcontroller. That's a PIC, C, uh, PIC 16 C774. It's a reasonably older model. So I have connected them both to the computer and I'm running the dyno. Uh, capture 2.0 software which comes with the microscopes you can download that uh, from their website so let me get here to images side by side here you can see the nice thing one of the nice features of the dino capture software is that if you have multiple microscopes you can set them all up side by side and these images are live you know I'm shaking my bringing my finger in front of them you can see they're live so let's take a look so on the left side here this is the the ADC board that I showed you and you can see there's quite a bit of glare on it and that's normal because the surface of the silk screen and the solder mask are quite shiny so the, the LED light reflects back and you get a whole bunch of glare so you can barely see that there is you know text written in here and so on so I can adjust the polarization by adjusting the polarization uh, rotator here by rotating this and you can take a look and see what happens to the image 
and how much more detail we can get out of this. So if I rotate the polarization, you can see there's a silk screen writings here which are barely readable. And I rotate that and you can see a whole bunch of detail coming into view. So by rotating this, you can get the different kind of uh, detail coming come and go into view depending on what you're interested in. So now we can see better, for example, the traces. You can see the very nice con dark contrast between the different traces. You can see all the component numbers and all the 0201 resistors and capacitors that are connected to this. This is an unpopulated IC. This is supposed to be a synthesizer that's not populated on this board. On the right side, I'm looking at the, mic the microcontroller with the uh, Dynolite H series, you can see that on this there are some extra icons here visible that allows you to, for, to do the extended dynamic range and the extended depth of field which you cannot do with the Dynolite Premier, but the polarization controller you can. And there's a whole bunch of other features here you can do for example turn the light on and off. If you have external light, if you have light coming in an angle then it's very useful to be able to turn this light off completely because you can get some other colors and other wavelengths uh, incidents onto the board which can be very useful. There is auto, auto exposure, you can turn that on and off, you can change the different levels on the exposure again which can be uh, very useful. Uh, again you can see you can bring a whole bunch of detail by uh, changing the exposure yourself manually. All of these are very very uh, beneficial when you're trying to manipulate the image and get the best image quality. And you can also change down here you can see the brightness, the contrast, the hue, everything, every possible thing you want to change about the image you can do and you can get the optimum image coming from it this way and I'm not going to play with it too much you're most likely familiar with the capabilities of these things and this software provides all of those. Now here we can see the die really nicely this is a die of the uh, microcontroller you can see all the wire bonds all around it very nice image and these glowing areas that you see are the reflection of the LEDs from the opening window, uh, the, the glass window of the die. So if I were to change the polarization here, you can see a whole bunch of new details will come into view. Remember that having some reflections off a particular surface can actually be useful to bring out some detail of the die like, like, like we have here. But I can also change the polarization and if you look the camera will readjust. Now you can see more of the different type of detail. You can see the bottom of the package, you can see the epoxy that's used to hold the die, the wire bonds are even more clear. And you can see this is the pad on the inside of the uh, package where the wire bonds jump onto. So very nice, quite good detail. And you can maximize this by the way. So you can maximize this image like so. There you go, now you have a <laughs> gigantic uh, view of the die and it's really clear. You can see this is most likely some memory over here. You can see the drivers next to each of the pins here and uh, again a whole bunch of different synthesized logic and we can zoom in further of course so I can go ahead and, and zoom in further and then bring the microscope down back into focus so I'm now lowering the microscope back down by rotating the top knob I should be lowering it really with a quick release but uh, I'm kind of sitting at an awkward angle there we go almost into view and here it is there. Now you can see uh, quite a bit more detail on the die itself. You can adjust the polarization. You can get even more. See, see by even even on looking at a die like this, by adjusting the polarization, you can get even more detail. So it can be really quite beneficial. And the the, the adjustment and the focus is really precise. I really like that stand. And it gives you this kind of detail. And you can capture an image, of course. And you can, like I said, I, I have mine set up to turn the LED light on off the capacitive dot touch button that I told you. But you can, of course, just, you know, just do whatever you want. You can tell it to, you know, video record. You can record a video. You can take a time lapse video. You can take an extended depth of field uh, image and so on. You can record anything. You can save anything. You can recover it. Anyhow, it's very easy and pretty straightforward. So let's minimize that back up there. And uh, so there's uh, some basic functionality, but I really want to show you the capabilities of the extended dynamic range and extended depth of field. But you can see the image quality is, is really nice. This is really zoomed in, I think, almost at the maximum. I, can, I should be able to zoom in even more. You see, this is not even the, the maximum yet. This is the maximum amount of zoom I can get. And the image quality, even at this, and this is because it's an optical uh, zoom here. That's, this is the reason why the image quality is so good. And you can see here some very periodic, most likely some, some memory here or some memory here from, I have to look at the exact uh, uh, architecture of it. But you can see, if I come to this corner, you can see how the wire bonds are done. 
you can see the wire bonds that these are typically done by other ultrasonic welding or by some physical pressure uh, that attaches them to these pads. These pads look like to be aluminum to me. But uh, you can see again the drivers here and there's some writings. I wondered there should be at some point in here, somewhere, microchips uh, numbers. I don't know where they usually put their numbers on these dies, but anyhow, you can see a fairly good view. Now, the, the frame rate is 30 frames per second. So 30 frames per second isn't, isn't, isn't great. I mean, 60 frames per second would be much better if you're doing live work. You can see if I were to move this back and forth that you have that kind of jelloy, jiggly uh, feel to it and that's because of course the frame rate is 30 frames per second. DinoLite also has other microscopes that, that offer higher frame rate or even microscopes that have direct uh, connection to the PC. So instead of having going through USB, you can actually directly go through DVR and connect it to a monitor directly. That way the, the latency is even smaller and they have 60 frames per second. Uh, instruments as well, but these are these are more in the price range that uh, that might be of interest to uh, to professionals and hobbyists and so on. But also, I wanted something with a USB that I can easily capture an image on the on the computer. But again, it looks very nice. So let's look at some more interesting things. So I have two other things under the microscope now. Uh, on the right side, I have a horn antenna. I think I showed you this in one of the earlier videos. This horn antenna is a uh, 325 gigahertz horn antenna so it has a very very small opening I can't remember what WR uh, what number this is but uh, it's intended to be at a very high frequency I wanted to take a look at this on the microscope uh, to show you the extended uh, depth of field capability of the microscope so that's the first thing on the, on the left side I have an RF probe uh, this is a composite probe and uh, you can take a closer look at it and this composite probe has a whole bunch of uh, DC needles uh, and then it also has a, a, a one RF input that I want to take a look at. This is supposed to be a 150 micron pitch probe so the needles in the, in the tip sh should be about 150 microns apart and I wanted to verify that just to make sure that that is indeed the case and I have uh, what I've also done is that I have replaced uh, the microscope uh, the the uh, 4113 model with this one, the 4515 ZTL, which includes the automatic magnification reading feature, which uh, the 4815 doesn't have. And that's something that I don't really fully understand why, because uh, I, from the perspective of these two, they, do, they look identical to me. And I wonder if that limitation that this one doesn't have automatic magnification reading is an artificial limitation or is really something to do with the hardware. It'd be something interesting to ask them. I'm curious uh, because it's a little bit annoying that this one doesn't have AMR uh, also included because it's the higher model so I would expect it to have all the features of this one plus the extended depth of field and the extended dynamic range but anyhow so let's take a look and see what we see on the screen again I've done the same thing and I have put the images side by side and as you can see let me raise this a bit the image quality again once again is quite good uh, so we can talk about two different things here. So on the left is the probe and you can see how, how nicely uh, all the needles are visible. Uh, this this uh, piece that you see here, this is a yellow, this uh, um, red the tape that you see here is copper connecting all the grounds of the capacitors which are these guys which are on the DC needles together so this is a DC this would be for example a, a voltage supply needle and it has a decoupling cap right on top of it and the ground of all the decoupling caps are connected together with a copper uh, film that you see here and it's also connected to the RF pins so you can see these pins here this is the ground signal ground pin different from all the other DC pins. Some pins here do not have the capacitors on them because they're digital I.O. pins so you don't want to decouple those obviously and then the DC pins that are used for power have decoupling and this pin here is the ground pin that's why the the cable uh, the ribbon copper ribbon is touching it. So now the interesting thing is here on the right side is the 4815 model and here is the 4115 model. So here you, you have the extended dynamic range and extended depth of field but uh, you don't have automatic magnification reading up here but if you look here it tells me that the magnification is 123.6 so it reads it directly from the uh, microscope most likely from a potentiometer that's connected to the magnification reading uh, control but I don't understand why it doesn't uh, 
uh, why this one doesn't have that. But anyhow, since it has them, but any, don't worry the, about the fact that this doesn't have this because you, you can use that ruler I showed you and calibrate the distances here. And once you calibrate the distances, then this will, you can easily get magnification value from here too. But anyhow, I haven't done that. So here we can see, so this, I, I remember I said that these are supposed to be uh, 150 microns apart. And uh, this software has a whole bunch of tools that you can use. You know, you can draw all kinds of shapes on it. And these shapes, and there's even more here. And then you can, it will tell you distances and there's a whole bunch of grids and circles and any, anything pretty much you can imagine. I'm just going to use the most basic thing, which is just to draw two lines. So I'm going to draw a line from starting from here. And let me go back in here. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but you will see it once I click. So I want to measure the distance between that pin and that pin. So I connect this person. You see now I have a free forming number and it's giving me the, the length. So if I go further and further, the length of this line goes up and I go right in the center of this guy right there and click it again. Oh, actually, there you go. Look at that. <laughs> I wasn't even looking at the number. So 0 0.15 millimeter, which is 150 micron. So the distance between these two pins is exactly 150 micron as it is supposed to be, as is the design specification of this probe. So you can do precise measurements uh, like that. And you can also change the, the focus plane, of course. And if I go up, uh, you can see that the cable becomes in, into focus. So now this cable is the ribbon that I was telling you, the copper ribbon is now in focus. Now if I go further up, you know, of course everything is out of focus. So I can go through different focusing levels to get that. So and I'll show you why. Now this is annoying. Why is it annoying is because, well, you ca I cannot have this in focus at the same time as the needles. And the reason for that is, of course, because depth of field is a function of distance to the subject. That's an optical limitation. It has nothing to do with these microscopes. So on the right side, the 4815, the, the 4815 model has this ability that allows you to capture multiple images, and the software will automatically reassemble them together and give you a, 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 an image that has a much higher extended dynamic range, extended depth of field. So here, for example, you can see that I am focused on the outer circle of the horn antenna. So this plane of, of focus is now in this distance. But the, the background, the screw and the, the waveguide holes and so on, they're all completely out of focus. If I want to get that in focus, then I just change the focus plane by moving down like so. And eventually I will get the focus on that plane. I'll keep going there pretty much you can see that now I have this part in focus now this part is out of focus so if I go back all the way to the highest plane of focus that I want to achieve which was here like so there's a button here called extended the extended depth of field and if I just hover on that you can see how it goes up and down and changes the focus field for me automatically so there's some optical components in there that move and change the the depth of field for me. So I can also change how many images I wanted to take. I can even can go even further down. So if I were just simply click on this, like so, it will take a whole bunch of pictures and it will start processing them. You can see that it's now this symbol here means it's processing. And once it processing is complete, it will the image will appear here. And I will open it and I'll put it side by side with this one so you can see the difference. So let me move this out of the way. And Open that. There we go. I'm going to put it next to this one. Now we can take a look. Look at this. You can see that this. You can see the difference quite clearly. Here, everything here is out of completely out of focus. But look how sharp this image is. Not only is this screw completely in focus, but also the tip of the waveguide is also in focus. Whereas here, the background is completely out of focus. So now we get an extended. Uh, depth of uh, field image out of this one. I can also take an extended dynamic range, although it, in this case it doesn't really matter too much because everything is pretty much uh, within the dynamic range. But if I click on that, it will take multiple images at different um, exposure levels and combine them to get an extended uh, dynamic range image. Although here again, this one doesn't really matter because everything is already in focus. I have to show you a better example of that. Well, anyhow, this one doesn't really do it justice, but let me erase this one so we don't need this anymore. But you can see the extended depth of field. Now I'm going to put the probe on, I'm going to take this probe and put it under this microscope so you can take, we can see a really extreme case of the extended depth of field. So, so here I've placed 
the, the probe under the microscope that has the extended depth of field, the 4815, and I want to capture uh, the details at the top of the connector while simultaneously capturing the details of the wire that's underneath it. So let me show you like so. So there is a quite a bit of distance between the surface of this uh, connector and the cables that are underneath it. So I can do that. I have uh, actually brought up the image. There we go. Completely on the screen. So I've maximized it. So you can see that the microscope is looking. Here's the connector that I was showing you. And here are the cables that are underneath it. So it's a very nice big image. And they're, they're at a totally different height. So this is much higher than this. That's why this is out of focus and that's in focus. And I can actually manually change the focus uh, from uh, from the top to all the way to here, so now you can see this a little bit slowly. This one will will come into focus, like like so. So uh, what I will do is that I will go to the top of the image and get the top of this surface of the screw in focus, like so. Perfect. And now I can go ahead and click on the extended depth of field button and I have set it to manual and this manual function is very useful because you click on it now it gives me this little window and this little window I can tell it exactly which images to capture at what depth of field uh, what plane of focus and then it will combine them so I will say okay well capture this one I click on capture so there's one capture in the queue and then I go forward one more and I say capture this one too and I just increase it until I'm satisfied we can see that the focus plane is changing and I continue capturing more and more images. There we go. Maybe one more. And one last one. There. So I've captured a whole bunch of images now and I can say start processing. I click that and it will continue to process for me. And then it will be once it's done, we can do a quick comparison between between the this image and the one that's live. This is a live image. You can see I can put my hand in front of it. So this is a live image and I'm going to do a, a comparison. So here you go. So processing is completed. I will open and maximize. There. This is the image after extended depth of field processing and this is the live. You can see I can go back and forth. The difference is quite dramatic. And this is not even the entire focus range it has. I've only used a small portion of the depth of field that it has. It can go even much, much further, capturing details at, at a much larger range of distances, which can be extremely helpful, especially if you're looking at situations where you're doing wire bonding or you're, uh, you're creating something that you need to really make sure that with a single image that everything is in focus. This will, this will definitely do it for you. So the last thing I want to look at is this Quinstar uh, PA. This is a, a PA module that has uh, K connectors at the input and the output. I actually couldn't find a data sheet for it right off the hand, but this is a broken unit. And I wanted to show you what's inside it. Uh, the cover, cup cover comes off. These things are all, by the way, manually hand assembled. So you and you'll appreciate how much work goes into it once I get this thing open. And um, you gotta always be very, very careful opening this, even though this is a broken unit. So the cap just comes off, and inside you can immediately see there's some circuitry and so on in there. But but the top of it is covered with this material. Now what what that is is that these are RF absorbers, and it's very common in a microwave module like this to have RF absorbers everywhere. And the reason for that is it's not a coincidence that this looks reflective to our eyes because it's reflective to EM uh, frequencies that our eyes can see, but it's also reflective to the EM frequencies that's within the operation of this amplifier. It's most likely up to 40 gigahertz. If you don't put EM absorbers in the in the strategic places like they've done here, then you can actually create cavities and resonances and reflections within the package that can cause all kinds of problems. Not not can it not only can it result in the response of the amplifier to being different, but it can actually cause oscillations because signals can jump from the input to the from the output back to the input of the amplifier because if this is a PA putting out a whole bunch of power at the output, it can actually reflect off the surface of the lid for example, and then bounce back to the input and cause a feedback and cause uh, instability as well as other problems. So I'm going to carefully take these uh, material off and I'm going to peel them off like so. You can see these are RF absorbers. You can actually buy these and it's, it's beginning to reveal uh, more and more circuit inside. So let me go ahead and carefully remove this and then we can put it under the microscope and see the magic inside. So here it is. I've taken the, the all the uh, RF absorbers off. Let me see if I can get you to take a look at it. There it is. You can see I put it under the microscope. So the RF absorbers that were right there. And it's also, also very interesting to note, as I was saying before, and this, this uh, verifies what I was mentioning as well, is that the RF absorbers are were all concentrated in this region. This is the output portion where 
the, the big PA is and I'll show you what how that PA construction is. This is quite beautiful actually to look at and the microscope does an amazing job revealing the detail. So you, you can see there's so much to learn by looking at this. Uh, if you haven't seen these type of circuits just by having a, you know, a microscope that can reveal the details in here. So I'm going to maximize this on the screen and we're going to go through it uh, step by step and then you can see the, the, the clarity and also the quality of the, of the picture. So here we go. So this is what, I, what we're looking at here is the input of the PA. So you can reason this out. Again, I don't know the data sheet. I haven't seen the data sheet for this. I couldn't find it. I did a quick search. So I'm just going to tell you based on my observation what, I, what, I, what this is doing. So this is the pin at the input. This is the pin that's connected to the connector from the outside. Signal comes in from here. And there's a filter at the input is because they want to filter out all the frequencies that the PA cannot process because um, otherwise the PA is going to be overwhelmed by frequencies that are out of band. So this is most likely uh, some narrow band filter. It could be maybe from 20 to 40 or so. And you can tell right away that this is a microwave filter, of course, and these lines, the distance between these lines and the shape of these lines will determine the frequency response of this filter. It looks really weird if you haven't done microwave engineering, but this is a fairly typical type of filter. Underneath this is the ground plane. So these are all uh, combinations of microstrip and uh, transmission lines and so on that, that make up the filter characteristic. This material, it looks like to be ceramic, uh, so it's a very high quality, low loss dielectric material that you can make uh, a nice um, a filter out of. So you can also see that there is no DC connection. So this filter not only gives you the, the filtering, it also gives you DC co AC coupling. So there's no current. So you they don't need to isolate the input with a capacitor anymore. So going forward and also, by the way, here, let, let me show you what happens if I change the polarization. If I change the polarization from, uh, I, I can get uh, quite a bit of different amounts of detail. So this is the real colors. If I change the polarization to the other extreme, you can see all the other details of the bottom of the package become uh, visible and also you can see that the, the reflection of the surface of the shiny uh, transmission lines and so on are more obvious. So there we go. So let's leave it like this and let's slowly move forward. So coming aft after that, after the filter, we have the first stage of the PA. Now let's take a look at this. So this is the, pre, the PA driver really because, because they cannot have uh, you want to have a certain amount of gain in the PA. So you have to have, make sure that you're able to give the last stage of the PA, which is the main stage that provides the Apple power with sufficient input signal. And this is what most likely this ASIC is. This ASIC is, of course, in the signal path. You can see the input of the filter has got three wire bonds that go to the input of the PA, the pre-PA driver, and then out from the output, it gets coupled out. These lines provide DC signal. These are ribbons. They're, they're using ribbon bonds here for, in this case, they're using ribbon bonds as opposed to wire bonds because they want to increase the current uh, handling capability. So this is a line that provides a lot of current from the DC. And you can see that it's coming around and getting distributed. These are resistors provided to, uh, for biasing and you can tap. Uh, this is a clever way of doing this type of layout. You can see the gold bonds in between these black lines. Those are resistors. So you can tap off on different locations. Let's say I want, I don't know, 50 ohms. Then I, you know, I, let's say these, each of these is 5 ohms. I take 10 of them. And if I want something else, let's say I take a different amount. So you can see they've tapped off here. So they're using you know, this portion of it. This is actually two different resistors, I believe. So here you can see this snake pattern here and ends here. And there is another one that ends here. And there is the ground connection at the bottom. So there's a bunch of different things you can do with this type of material. Everything is on a ceramic board. <laughs> All of this is manually hand assembled. What a nightmare uh, this is. That's why these are sold by uh, units one at a time. They don't make many of these. You have to ask for them. This is most likely a, a gas, a gallium arsenide substrate. I believe this, I think it is, I, I'm guessing it could be uh, some other uh, technology. It's most like either, it's either gas or indium phosphide, uh, but I believe it's gas. So this is a, the, the first PA driver. We can continue going forward. Uh, this is just, I believe, some interconnect. I don't think this really does anything else uh, other than just connecting from the input to the output. And there is some more, this is a spacers again. They're just doing this because they, they have no choice. The package size is limited. And then they go into another uh, transistor here. So this is the first... Uh, PA, the main big PA's transistor, looks like a gas transistor again. We go from the input to the output, and it has the biasing and various things connected to it. And here's the main, main PA. And this main PA uses power combining. So here is the power splitter and a power combiner. So here it, it, it splits the power into two, so maintaining a 50 ohm environment. The power is split between the two. Here's some load resistor in the middle, and it splits it into two, provides the first PA, 
again splitting it to two. Here's another PA, it looks really shiny because of the polarization. I can change the polarization to bring more detail and there you go. Now you can see this one. The reason this is glowing and this one is not is because this has a slightly different angle. It's probably not completely flat and therefore it's not reflecting the light in the same way as this one is. But you can see the details of it much better like this. So the, the signal comes in, gets split with this microwave splitter, goes through the two final transistors of the PA and then it combines them together once again and goes to the output like so and connects to the output. So the output of this looks to me, if I'm not mistaken, to be DC coupled. But um, again, I don't have the data sheet, but I don't see any AC coupling in this path anywhere. But you can see so much beautiful detail from the microscope here. And let's look at some of the uh, biasing circuitry. Here we go. This is this section of the I see has some biasing circuitry in it. It could be at most likely a voltage regulator or some other. These are these are uh, they look like to be a whole bunch of transistors are all aligned here. I probably some regulation going on against some resistors here. I'm not sure what this is. It could be it could be a capacitor or a resistor. It's also I I cannot tell what that is. Um, actually, could be even a diode. So here you go. You can see a whole bunch of again details. These are uh, of course uh, capacitors, and here's another capacitor right there. There's a whole bunch of, uh, actually this probably is most likely a diode, protection diode right there. And uh, here's some more resistors, you can see some more ribbon wires at the top. And this is again the PA at the input. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, reasonably quick look at the DinoLite microscopes. I have their catalog here and of course you can find their catalog on their website. Uh, and go take a look. They, they offer a really, really wide range of products. All kind of different uh, types of uh, inputs and outputs including, uh, like I was saying, uh, HDMI and uh, VGA and DisplayPort and so on. So you can get, uh, depending on what your application is, a really, really quite a, a wide range of stuff. And you all, they also have uh, microscopes that, that put, put out a particular wavelength for, you know, photoluminescence experiments and all. And sometimes you want to uh, excite a particular um, material which only gets excited with a, with a specific wavelength. You can use uh, filters and LEDs that have a calibrated wavelength output. And also, they get information about how their calibration mechanism works. You can easily calibrate your microscopes, even if it doesn't have the amplitude uh, reading out directly. You can calibrate it out. And there's a whole bunch of accessories and uh, different magnifications. Uses for not just limited to electronics, of course, using for uh, biology and other kind of fields and so on. So go ahead and take a look at their website. They have a whole bunch of demos also themselves. And, you know, I hope you really enjoyed it. And uh, as, as always, if you happen to purchase something uh, because you saw the, the demo here on my website, just let them know where you saw the demo because it always helps me have a good relationship with the manufacturers. And again, I, I usually tell you exactly what I think about the product. I like these. Uh, my only complaint is the low frame rate, which makes it a little bit difficult to work live under the microscope. But other than that, everything looks really good and hopefully they can come up with uh, more products in the future that would allow you to um, have a higher frame rate at uh, you know, affordable prices, prices. So go ahead and take a look and uh, get, ask them for a code or a prices. These, these, these units that I have uh, uh, showed you, uh, they would range with a standard about $1,000 or so. They're a little bit pricey, but uh, again, they, they do a pretty good job. So take a look. They have a wide range of prices. And uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And well, until next time.